Welcome to our global audience. It is a privilege to moderate this special event dedicated to the MOU signing ceremony between the Financial Inclusion Center at the World Business Angel Investment Forum, an affiliated partner of the G20 Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, and the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the George Washington University. This collaboration aims to establish an academic partnership that will contribute to the development of skills and expertise of students and faculty members, assist in the digital transformation of higher education institutions, and foster creative thinking for innovation and success in this dynamic 21st century business environment. Please allow me to briefly provide an agenda for today. After special remarks from Executive Chairman Bebar Zaltuntas and by Professor Dr. Pamela Norris, Vice Provost for Research at George Washington University, we will invite our guest speakers to a virtual roundtable discussion. Professor Dr. Inderjit Singh, President of WBF Global Startup Committee, welcome. Jim Chung, Associate Vice President for Research at OIE George Washington University, welcome. And Chuck Brooks, Advisory Board Member WBF USA and President of Brooks Consulting, welcome. Thank you. This event will conclude with a brief MOU signing ceremony. So we're looking forward uh, to, to that moment. That is also a culmination for me after 26 years in academia and 13 years of resilience in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. So it gives me great pleasure to see that we're coming together today to, to join forces and, and contribute to this important, vital ecosystem. Before we start with our agenda, I just wanted to share a brief sentence from a recent report published by the Brookings Institution that highlighted, quote, in a nation plagued by regional economic divides, research universities are uniquely distributed innovation asset. Unlike innovation sector employment challenges, high growth startups and venture capital, research universities are spread across the nation. Over 200 research universities located in all 50 states expend more than 50 million annually on research and development. This same report also underscored that this effort requires investing in talent, research, and development, entrepreneurship, and infrastructure. I think this quote clearly speaks to the reason why we have this MOU today, so I just wanted to share it before we start. And now, please allow me to share brief bios of uh, our first guest speaker, Chairman Bebar Saltuntas, welcome. He's the former senior advisor of the London Stock Exchange Group for the Elite Program. Chairman, of course, of the World Business Angel Investment Forum, an affiliated partner of the G20 Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, chaired by the Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, co-chair of the Washington DC-based Global Business Angels Network, vice president of the Brussels-based European Trade Association for Business Angels, and early state mar market players, IBAN, president of the Business Angel Association of Turkey, the World Entrepreneurship Forum Ambassador to Turkey and the Balkan countries and President of Dulcom International. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, dear uh, Ingrid. Um, and all the best from Istanbul. Uh, dear Ingrid, uh, invention, mm -hmm. you know, was very important in 1950s, 60s, 70s. But today, this is not the case. Today, innovation, that counts. Why? Because in 1950s, 60s, customer, consumer, they were ready to consume anything invented. But today, almost everything invented. So invention is not important. Innovation is important. By the way, governments of today support uh, innovation more than invention. Why? Because innovation is bringing new jobs, new wealth, social justice, and of course, new taxes uh, for, for governments. But who will convert invention to innovation? We need a catalyzer between uh, these two concepts. They are entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are now playing a very critical role uh, for the world economy. And they are the ones, as a matter of fact, who create the innovation success stories for, for innovation ecosystem in, in the world. But entrepreneurs of today have a challenging uh, issue, access to finance. 
But which kind of finance? I think they need smart finance, which is a bundle of network, mentorship, and know-how. So entrepreneurs of today need more than money to create success stories in, in, in the world. So George Washington University's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center brand is very meaningful because it is including entrepreneurs in the game. And I think innovation plus entrepreneurship means for me successful entrepreneurship. So I'm thanking so much to our colleagues in Washington, DC uh, to make this collaboration happen. And I am sure not only startups, startup founders, entrepreneurs uh, of the center at the George Washington University will find a rewarding experience from this collaboration, but also all George Washington University ecosystem will uh, benefit uh, from our global efforts. Dear uh, Professor Norris, thank you very much uh, for your efforts. It was great to have you last year in Turkey as a speaker uh, in our World Congress and hope to see you again. And also dear uh, the, the, the Dr. Chung uh, in our next Congress, which will be, uh, be in South Africa next, next month. And looking forward to collaborating more to empower the world economy through entrepreneurship and innovation. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for your special remarks. We're grateful that you could join us today. And now please allow me to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Norris. She previously served in roles as Executive Dean, the Executive Associate Dean for Research and Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Studies in the, at the University of Virginia, School of Engineering and Applied Science. She is also the Frederick Trace Morse Professor Emerita of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. She was honored with the Society of Women Engineers Distinguished Engineering Education Award, and she is well known for leadership in the field of nanotechnology education, chairing the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, National Nanotechnology Institute's Committee on Nanotechnology Education, elected an, as an honorary member of ASME, which is the American Society for Mechanical Engineers. And she recently served as the Vice President of Institutional Councils for the American Society for Engineering Education and as a Chair of the Engineering Research Council. And to make it even harder, we also are very honored that you are part of our WBF USA Advisory Board. We're very grateful for that. Thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Acora, I appreciate it. And thank you very much, Executive Chairman Baber. We're very happy to be entering into this uh, partnership. We all know higher education plays a critical role in producing the next generation of innovators. To prepare future citizens of the world, we have a responsibility to educate problem seekers. That is, problem seekers, they don't just solve the challenges that they're presented with, they proactively seek out problems and suggest solutions that will make institutions and technologies more effective, more equitable, and more inclusive. At the George Washington University, we are a leader in the National Science Foundation i program, a program that gives researchers the tools they need to move an invention to the marketplace and to begin to think like an entrepreneur. And we take those core teachings from the i program directly to underrepresented to communities here in DC, as well as around the world, increasing financial inclusion. We're also proud to be leading a new innovation district focused on diversity, equity, and inclusiveness, just blocks away from the White House. Perhaps our most impactful effort is our quest to create a culture of entrepreneurship by incorporating innovation training into our academic programming. Our classroom modules use principles of evidence-based innovation processes and move them into the classroom. Whether for business, engineering, or social innovation, our classroom modules take an agnostic approach to in innovation, teaching innovation techniques that are essential to any sphere or discipline. Our new venture competition is a year long educational exercise where students and faculty learn to develop innovative business and social entrepreneurial endeavors. 
students learn the basics of how to articulate a problem solution fit. Who are you helping? What are you helping with? Why is the change needed? And how much do you need to improve on the current alternatives to provide impact to the intended beneficiaries? GW is a leading creator of innovators in the Unicorn Club. Many of our GW affiliated Unicorn founders participated in our entrepreneurship programming. As I'm sure this community knows, early training provides lifelong benefits. We're excited to be entering into this educational partnership with the WBAF Financial Inclusion Center. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for your remarks. And I'm looking forward to having some of the exciting startups from your team join us in Durban, South Africa. You have an amazing uh, hub there, and I was uh, really intrigued by the quality of startups that uh, I've been presented with, so we're excited. So uh, now, please allow me to move on to our next stage. I would like to briefly introduce our distinguished guests that will be part of our virtual roundtable, and all of them, as their bio will highlight, have spent their career bridging both academia as well as the entrepreneurship ecosystem and the business ecosystem, so I think you'll enjoy very much their, their remarks. First, please allow me to introduce uh, Professor Inderjit Singh, former member of the parliament in Singapore, Chairman of the Singapore Government Parliamentary Committee for Finance, Trade and Industry, currently serving as WBF President. He's also Chairman of Intuitive, Chief Executive Officer of Solstar International, President of the Singapore Chapter of the Indus Entrepreneurs, former Deputy Chairman of Action Community for Entrepreneurs, Founder and former UTAC President and Chief Executive Officer, former Director at Texas Instruments Singapore, member of the board of Nanyang Technology University, and he holds a degree in electronics engineering from Nanyang Technology University, as well as an MBA and an honorary doctorate. Welcome, Professor Singh. I know for you it's very late, so we'll try to, <laughs> to keep <laughs> it. Sorry. It's okay. Right. Next, please allow me to introduce, of course, uh, Jim Chung, founding director at the Office of Entrepreneurship at the George Washington University. He promotes of course, in his role, university-wide faculty and student entrepreneurship and technology transfer through support for innovation, education, venture creation, and connections. He's co-principal investigator and national instructor for the National Science Foundation, DC iCorps Node. His portfolio includes George Washington New Venture Competitions, Startup Incubator, and Lean Startup Training. He's also the former director of the MTech Venture Accelerator at the University of Maryland College Park where he was responsible for launching and mentoring startups from university intellectual property with faculty and students. He launched several startups, ran the Chesapeake Bay Seed Capital Fund, held the role of director of new business development, doing M&A for the corporate executive board there. Prior to the corporate executive board, he was vice president of Intervalle Capital and managing director for Ink Tank Ventures. Before entering the private sector, he was an academic researcher at a number of leading institutions, including Harvard University, MIT Sloan School of Management, University of Tokyo, and Korea Advanced Institute for Science and Technology. Welcome. Thank you. And then last but not least, our WBF board advisory member as well, Chuck Brooks. He's a globally recognized thought leader and subject matter expert in cybersecurity and emerging technologies. He's also an adjunct faculty at Georgetown University Graduate Cybersecurity Risk Management Program, where he has taught courses on risk management, emerging technologies, and cybersecurity. LinkedIn named Chuck as one of the top, top five uh, tech people to follow. He was named Cybersecurity Person of the Year for 2022 by the Cyber Express and one of the world's 10 best cybersecurity and technology experts by Best Rated. Also a top 50 global influencer on risk compliance by Thomson Reuters, best of the world in security by CISO platform and numerous other accolades. He's a cybersecurity expert also for the network at the Washington Post, visiting editor at the Homeland Security Today, expert for executive mosaic GovCon and a contributor to Skytop Media. He's regularly featured in numerous venues, including an important contributor to Forbes. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. 
So now that I shared brief highlights from your uh, distinguished long-term career, I wanted to get your thoughts from the boots on the ground experience currently about how you think we can bridge some of the remaining challenges we see in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. And we'll start with focusing on what can angel investment networks do? So Professor Singh, maybe you can share your current uh, insights about what we are doing at WBF and what you think we should be doing globally as angel investment groups to help the current ecosystem. And then we'll move okay. on to Jim and then to Chuck. All right, yeah. Thank you, uh, Ingrid, for the introduction. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, Bypass mentioned just now about uh, inventions and innovation. And uh, so the biggest challenge universities have uh, is our ability to bring the inventions to industry. And, and, and uh, this is where uh, we see uh, and I, I have 20 years experience in uh, NTU uh, and I was uh, focused as a board member focused on innovation for the university. And we see a great challenge that professors face or researchers face in trying to bring it to, uh, bring uh, invention to industry and to, uh, to, to apply uh, what they have uh, worked on in, in their research. And so what we attempted to do uh, in NTU was to create an ecosystem in the university uh, that, that just not focuses on the research that they do, but also brings in a community of, uh, of players who actually matter most. And one of the most important uh, uh, component of that uh, of the ecosystem uh, uh, um, uh, investors, early stage investors who understand uh, what it takes to bring the research a bit further down uh, so that it's ready for industry. And, and the second part that we focus on uh, in NTU was uh, to uh, build a community of mentors. And, and it makes a huge difference when you have someone who's got industry experience and uh, hand holding the professors and the researchers and also students at times uh, to uh, to give them a sense of reality of what the industry is really uh, looking at and and so we have many programs uh, in addition to entrepreneurship education uh, we also have uh, experiential learning and we have programs at the uh, uh, icops uh, that uh, Pamela mentioned just now uh, and we call it the uh, uh, the lean launchpad methodology uh, where we create that product market fit and, uh, and, 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 and show our researchers and professors that you have to start with the market and the customers and not with your product. And if you can do that, then you can create that fit. So, so we created an ecosystem that brought all these players and uh, that kind of uh, gave us some success uh, in our attempt to bring our research to the industry. Thank you. Jim, you, you are also bridging all these worlds. What challenges do you still see when you try to, to collaborate with angel investment groups and what could we do better to bridge the gaps that still exist? Yeah, so at GW, we're doing, I think, very many similar things to what um, Professor Singh just uh, mentioned. Um, we are really creating the framework for our inventors, entrepreneurs, and students and how to think about innovation and to bring their inventions to market. Um, at the university, we're very much focused on the process that um, Dr. Singh just um, described in terms of how do you think about what your innovation can do for your potential customers. So we have that infrastructure in place at the university, but we cannot be experts in every single field out there or every industry, every technology. So we rely very heavily on our mentor network. Um, so these are primarily um, entrepreneurs who have done it before. And many of them are angel investors. They are out there already. They're continuing to do their investments, to continue to be serial entrepreneurs. And they lend their expertise to our entrepreneurs, our inventors, our professors, as they're trying to think about how to bring their um, inventions to market. So that mentor network that provides that real world experience is extremely important to what we're doing. Um, in addition, of course, to the capital they provide. But to be honest, most uh, angel investors are not doing you know, dozens of investments uh, every year. Um, the real kind of impact I think they have is in giving clear feedback, guidance, and mentorship to our students and faculty who are trying to launch new companies. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. 
Chuck, you also bridge all three worlds, academia, entrepreneurship, and business. So can you share particularly maybe the angle from an economic growth perspective and how these three worlds can uh, help economic recovery? Cybersecurity is listed actually as one of the highest contributors to the economy with more than 3.5 million jobs worldwide and in the US, 750,000 jobs open in cybersecurity. So I think it's a huge opportunity for the entrepreneurship ecosystem to contribute to that. Can you share your expertise? Sure. Uh, you, you said it. Uh, cybersecurity is a growth area for, for the next decade or two, along with artificial intelligence. Um, I think those two areas are going to be uh, connected to everything digitally in the world that we see. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. And, and, and going back to the angel role, uh, as, as someone that's been in an, an industry and government, I, I see nothing more important than angel investors because ideas don't get launched without uh, angels with the mentorship and, and the financing. And the problem has been, there's probably been too few. And the other problem is that, is that they're uh, often competing uh, with the, uh, misguided notion that a lot of these small business companies want to take it to investment banks and others and they're not ready because they don't have revenue. So I think one of the gaps that needs to be filled is, is really to expand communication uh, to these inventors and entrepreneurs that there's other ways to do it and, and working with universities, working with uh, uh, technology hubs is one way to go and maybe having the ability to, to identify more angel investors and bring in perhaps family offices to the equation would probably be uh, one of the goals I think that needs to be done because, as I said, uh, you know, it, if you don't have the initial funding and expertise and mentorship to launch, you're not going to get to the next stage. So I think it really is a, the catalyst for everything. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your insights as well. And I also wanted us to touch a little bit on on the transfer of knowledge and of course transfer of technology the commercialization efforts you all referenced them and we know that's a big problem also patents maybe if we can touch a little bit on the key vital role academia plays in in patents and technology transfer so let's start with uh jim on this one can you share a little bit how your center helps the ecosystem with knowledge transfer and what you do for educating faculty and entrepreneurs and the business ecosystem and for patents? Sure. So um, my office works very closely with our technology commercialization office. They're focused on making sure that the inventions at the university are protected um, and looking for potential licensees for what they're doing. Um, but, you know, we need to have the, the, the collaboration of those inventors um, with potential licensees or, you know, with the entrepreneurs that are licensing their technologies. And in some cases, even the professors themselves launching companies. So what we have done through our i program and our other training programs is to really get these inventors to think like entrepreneurs. Um, you know, your typical academic is did not get into research or academia to become an entrepreneur. Um, what they want to do is they want to pursue scientific challenges, answer questions, learn, you know, get, gain new knowledge for the world. Um, and this innovation aspect of it is usually not on their minds when they start out. So what we do is we help them to think like entrepreneurs, um, think about what is it that their research can do outside of academia? What kind of impact can it have on potential um, customers and other stakeholders and beneficiaries. Um, so that's the that's the main role that we have played uh, in working with um, getting the inventions out of the real world. And, th and that aspect has been missing um, for you know many years as as we heard in the opening remarks, it's invention was the way that we thought about things in the past, but now we have to also take that extra step and seeing how that invention can actually have an impact. So that's been our main role at the university. Thank you. Professor Singh, you also addressed this when you answered the first round of questions. So maybe you can provide a little bit more depth of how we can solve this and also what we're doing at WBF in the SDI committee and in the startup committee to address this problem. Uh, so uh, a few things. Uh, first of all uh, is uh, what motivates the professors, uh, like uh, Jim mentioned, uh, uh, you know, publishing papers and uh, being cited in research uh, is probably the first priority. And 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 the universities are organized that way to uh, for the 
a tenure and promotion systems where you know you the more papers you publish, the more you get recognized. So one of the first things that we did uh, some years ago when we were trying to get uh, you know uh, more uh, into the innovation uh, ecosystem and to create many more startup was to to uh, reward professors for also you know for doing innovation and for startups. And and so so their promotion will not get jeopardized. Uh, if they publish less papers, you you know, and if you have in in place uh, inventions uh, that that can be uh, can be commercialized, we recognize that uh, 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 for promotion. Now the other thing on on uh, on capital is that sometimes uh, you know we try our, our best to uh, bridge uh, 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 angel investors, uh, and many of our community members are angel investors and, and entrepreneurs themselves who who actually also succeeded uh, because of the work that we helped them with when they were in the university and they come back and uh, they become the initial investors. But that was still a challenge for us. And one of the things that we had to do in MTU was to create our own uh, innovate, uh, our own investment fund, a small fund uh, that gives the seed uh, uh, um, investment uh, before we get the external uh, uh, investment. So we, we play that bridging uh, uh, role uh, so that you know we can get the research out a bit further uh, to be a bit more uh, uh, commercial ready uh, before we uh, we bring in the external and that actually helped us a lot. And I like to say that you know we actually created a unicorn uh, with that kind of support that we gave to a professor before he could get any support from outside. Now the third thing that we did was uh, uh, many a times uh, when when uh, when I took charge of innovation in the university. Uh, we had, like many universities, a uh, uh, technology transfer office, and it was a department within the university. And because of the governance structure of the university, things moved a bit slow. So what I did was I recommended to the board, and we basically, when the board approved, we created an innovation company called Intuitive. So now, uh, and I was the chairman of Intuitive, and, and Intuitive role was to do all of these things, to create a whole innovation ecosystem, experiential learning, and commercialization and technology transfer. So we had it all in a separate company with their own board of directors, and we made our decisions and we moved a lot faster. So if you look around the world, uh, the universities that organize uh, in the innovation is organized as a company as we did in NTU, a Hebrew university is like that. And of course, there are also models that they organize as a department or an organization within the university. But we felt that creating the organize, uh, that company, innovation company, allowed us to move a lot more faster and we played a very, uh, you know, uh, private sector role that helped the professors, uh, you know, get out quickly. Thank you, Chuck. I would love to hear your perspective on how cybersecurity can help entrepreneurship and how entrepreneurship can help with <laughs> those cybersecurity roles. I wanted to also remind our audience that last year. Our uh, WBF SDI committee worked on publishing best practices for cybersecurity in entrepreneurship. That was uh, um, triggered by numerous world institutions publishing reports that highlighted that startups and scale-ups and SMEs are highly vulnerable to cybersecurity attacks, that more than 48% of cybersecurity attacks actually happened on companies that were either recently started or were uh, pivoting because they are unfortunately easy targets to, to cyber attacks. So can you share a little bit your expertise and, and insights, how we can bridge that gap and maybe bolster our efforts? Yeah, I, I think that the cybersecurity community in the past few years has become one of the more developed entrepreneurial communities, uh, largely because there's so much opportunity in so many different areas. Cybersecurity is not monolithic. There's so many different aspects of it. And from communication to encryption to, to endpoints, everything you could think about, um, and even protocols. So I think uh, a lot of that experience now has been written about and talked about. There's a lot of organizations that are dealing with it. So there's a lot of wealth of information out there that's really good to go to. And uh, also you see from the mistakes, you see where investments went wrong and how they, they proceeded wrong. So I think lessons learned, cybersecurity is a really good uh, place to do it. And, and also I wanted to get back to the commercialization part because that's also critical uh, for cybersecurity. Uh, I used to be a science and technology director at the Department of Homeland and Security years back. And uh, first of all, we worked with a lot of universities primarily because they were great centers for excellence and they had the best uh, uh, expertise and diversity of opinion. And we also worked with the National Lab. But one thing we found out is that there was no commercialization officers back then. Um, they had great ideas. Uh, sometimes actually prototypes, but they couldn't bring them to market. So commercialization 
Uh, it started, you know, back in the early 2000s. Now it's really, it's, it's developed. But I think it's really an essential element that people are missing. Uh, they often create something and they don't look at the market. And I think that's where mentorship and angel investors can really be of, of big help. And uh, now with these uh, universities also having commercialization officers and also the national labs, of course, uh, there's a wealth of, of opportunity to, to go uh, with them. And then the other part is partnering. I mean, think uh, when you're looking at cybersecurity now, you're seeing a, a, a lot of hubs where you're partnering with, with government, with industry and academia. And I think that fusion of that knowledge and those capabilities, particularly in advisory roles, um, really brings in new ideas and new opportunities. And I think that's the wave of the future. Thank you so much. And for the last round of uh, our virtual roundtable, I was hoping we can touch a little bit on the topic that's near and dear to all our hearts, which is financial inclusion. And it's a big portion of our mission and also justice. So if we can talk a little bit about how each of our organizations is, is aiming to bridge the gaps that still exist in financial inclusion, and maybe also address how both of our organizations are contributing to reducing the digital divide because entrepreneurship has a big role in, in that realm as well. So let's uh, start uh, again with uh, Jim, then uh, Professor Singh, and then Chuck. So um, financial inclusion, diversity, equity, inclusion is extremely important to everything that we're doing at GW. So you heard Dr. Norris mention our Penn West Equity and Innovation District. Um, everything that we're doing in that innovation district is really um, with the mind towards um, uh, equity and inclusion. Um, we have things like our Trustworthy AI Institute, uh, which is um, part of the, um, the uh, innovation district. Um, that's focused on making sure AI is fair, equitable, trustworthy. It does what it's supposed to do, right? Um, we have our Equity Institute, which is looking at things like making sure that um, policing uh, technologies are, are fair and equitable. Um, so these are the kinds of things that, that we're focused on in terms of our innovation district. Uh, we also have a number of programs that are focused at targeting underserved communities of entrepreneurs. So we have our Entrepreneur Development Network, DC, that takes the curriculum that we co-developed with the National Science Foundation for researchers in universities, and we've adapted it to underserved communities, entrepreneurs that may not have the same type of technologies that they're developing, but they still need to go through that lean startup, lean innovation process as they're going um, to understand how their own um, enterprises um, uh, need to find that pro product market fit. We've also um, developed a number of programs for international audiences, including um, developing countries. So we've done over 45 programs in over 20 plus countries around the world uh, where we're applying this lean startup approach um, to um, increase uh, financial inclusion, um, not just domestically, um, but around the world. Um, so um, it's very keen, uh, we're very keen on that. And we're, one of the reasons why we're so excited about this new MOU with, um, with WBAF, um, because it helps us bring our approach um, to an even broader global audience and to include um, global um, angel investors in to helping these um, uh, financial inclusion um, initiatives. Thank you so much. Professor Singh? Yeah, so I think in, in Singapore, uh, uh, if we we uh, financial inclusion is not a big problem compared to many countries. We are a small country, uh, quite tightly knit, and and so uh, we don't have a serious uh, problem. But uh, wherever there are gaps, uh, we get uh, the government plays a very active role in bridging the gap in in terms of those communities that have difficulty startups. You know uh, that uh, have uh, difficulty getting financing or small and medium enterprises who are not attractive enough to get uh, investment from uh, from external professional uh, investors or VCs, uh, and, and, and the government comes in and plays that, uh, that uh, bridging role. But one of the things that we did uh, in the last few years as a country, uh, not just at the university, was to create this thing we call the Global Innovation Alliance. And this was basically to create networks within Southeast Asia and also broader Asia, uh, where we link our entrepreneurs, uh, our investors, uh, with uh, entrepreneurs and investors in the region. And many a times, uh, you know, uh, our universities in, uh, in Singapore, uh, we do great work in research and we uh, develop great technologies that 
many a times are needed in some of these uh, uh, developing regions in Southeast Asia. So through the Global Innovation Alliance, we are able to uh, bridge that gap, not just in Singapore, but across uh, across the uh, country. So I think, you know, uh, locally, I think in the 20 years ago, it was an issue, but we kind of uh, have solved the financial inclusion uh, problem uh, quite a bit. In terms of uh, digital divide, uh, I, I think this is where uh, we have actually had the intended goal in, uh, in government uh, to try to help the communities here who find it difficult to do their digital transformation programs. And the ones that have a lot of difficulties are startups, and also many uh, uh, older traditional small and medium enterprises that don't know how to do it, don't have the technology, and are not willing to invest. And uh, we created uh, many incentive programs to incentivize the small and medium enterprises to, uh, uh, to buy technology to work with universities. We incentivize the universities and the polytechnics to work with the small and medium enterprises uh, through financial uh, uh, incentives, uh, through uh, tax breaks and so on that will hopefully uh, in, uh, create that drive uh, in the communities that underserved in the area of digital transformation so that they can accelerate. So we have done that. This has been going on in the last four to five years. And actually, we are seeing very, uh, very good uh, progress in this area. Thank you. Doc, you're also teaching. What do you see in, in, in this respect? What's going on in terms of ability for the education ecosystem and entrepreneurship to help with some of the financial inclusion and diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts? Well, I'm seeing, uh, I can personally say from my own classes, having you know taught, I think now almost going on a decade between John Hopkins and Georgetown, um, that the class uh, structures have changed in terms of the, uh, there's a lot more uh, women represented, um, it's going up maybe 30% and also under represented minorities. So I see it in the academia, uh, you know, more and more people are going into science and engineering and cybersecurity, which is a great trend. I also monitor and work a lot with, with government and I'm seeing a lot of SBIR programs and 8A and hub zone efforts expanded. And uh, this is a significant help because it, it reaches a lot of communities that don't have access uh, to financial um, uh, resources or or expertise and, and it, it you know with now with remote work too you're able to do a lot more with them so I think I think the trends are looking positive and I, when I go around to conferences I, I just returned from Lucerne and uh, I saw that that a lot of the people speaking now are not the same old uh, uh, you know people there, there's a lot younger people there's a lot more women a lot more people of color it's a it's a really different environment than it used to be and and they're not all necessarily coming from the uh, of the CEO, super wealthy uh, community. So I think it's, it's, it's really sort of changing in a good way. And I think, uh, you know, from my own personal opinion, the more diversity of thought, the more type of people you'll have involved in a project, the more likely it's gonna succeed. Uh, you're not gonna be tunnel vision and you're gonna really look at who the market is. So I think uh, the personas that are gonna actually use the technology. So uh, uh, I'm happy to see the trends happen this way. And I think, uh, you know, by having these, these uh, centers for entrepreneurship, you really, helping uh, promote this in a big way. Thank you so much. Also, our WBF Financial Inclusion Center offers uh, a lot of the support that you all mentioned. So we're looking forward to, to offering our courses, our mentorship, our uh, coaching opportunities to all students around the world. Um, and now, Chairman Weber's, would you like to add any of our efforts on financial inclusion and the recent academic uh, partnerships to share with our audience? If you like, I can give some current developments about the um, uh, engagement of different countries with the WBF's financial inclusion program. I was in Kenya uh, three days ago uh, in Mombasa and Kenya government's uh, innovation agency signed an um, agreement with WBF uh, to, to engage with the financial inclusion program for the incubation centers, acceleration centers, and technology transfer offices uh, around around uh, Kenya, um, you know, um, in the in the grand opening ceremony of the World Congress of Angel Investors on twenty first of November in Durban, at the uh, Durban ICC International Convention uh, Center in South Africa, uh, we will host almost uh, fifteen uh, university vice chancellors from Pakistan under the leadership of Higher Education Council of Pakistan governments, who are also joining the financial inclusion program. And in Pakistan, 
the government identified 15 universities and funding their incubation and acceleration centers. Uh, and Rwanda uh, government, uh, Science and Technology uh, Council, uh, also now uh, want to make an agreement with DBEF uh, to proceed with the um, easing, not access to finance, but easing access to new markets uh, of uh, R&D uh, projects uh, of the of the uh, universities in in the in, in the country. Uh, so now I think uh, George, uh, this collaboration with George Washington University's uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center uh, will be uh, a, a important uh, important uh, collaboration uh, to also uh, make know how transfer to these uh, countries. Thank you. Dr. Norris, any final comments before we move to the mini ceremony? I, I just want to reinforce the concept of so exciting to see the STEM workforce beginning to get um, uh, the gender representation that we'd all like to see. It's essential um, that we all know when you have a diversity of perspectives at the table, the solutions that you generate and the possible solutions are more creative. Um, that industry has seen that for a while. It's just taken us a little bit longer to, to catch up. Um, one of my passions is trying to diversify the STEM workforce. Um, and I think as engineers, we've done a terrible job of advertising what engineers do. We make important contributions to the world all the time. It's, it, um, I, I wish that all um, kids girls and minorities could understand the impact you can have on making the world a better place as an engineer. So um, it, it, it's really exciting to see some progress being made, but we're not doing it quickly enough. I am excited, however, at George Washington University, our School of Engineering and Applied Science is about 50% female, which exceeds the national average by more than 20%. So it's very exciting. Thanks for having us, Ingrid. Thank you so much. And you recently got an award uh, at a very big uh, movement that honors women in technology, the Global Women in Tech. So we see <clears throat> a lot of efforts. And one of our other board members at WBF is actually the North America Lead for Women in AI. So slowly, slowly, I think we're seeing changes. WBF also has a Global Women's Leaders Committee, and I'm always excited to support all the initiatives we have uh, under that committee's uh, guidance. Thank you so much. So now <clears throat> to honor our MOU, I just wanted to maybe do a quick surprise lightning round to see what all of you would forecast for 2024. And uh, just a brief round robin, what would you say will 2024 bring to the entrepreneurship ecosystem? So let's start with Chuck. Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of fusion of technologies. Um, largely enabled by artificial intelligence right now or what is happening with artificial intelligence. So I think you're going to uh, see a lot more opportunities of, of different uh, combinations, particularly in healthcare and, and other industries that involve a lot of different uh, approaches to, to technology. I can concur. We've done several global fundraising stage events uh, for the USA office as part of our efforts for the global one. And 90% of the startups that are submitting proposals have AI and specifically generative AI embedded into their platforms or services. So we can see that trend, definitely. Uh, Professor Singh, what's your forecast for 2024? Yeah, I'm seeing uh, AI becoming a tool and not a core technology anymore. I mean, it's basically going to be used something to enhance business models of many types of, of businesses. Uh, uh, blockchain, I think, you know, uh, and cryptocurrencies are going to make a comeback uh, once the world settles down a bit. So we should not uh, think that it's gone, it's, it's, it's going to come back. Uh, and uh, cybersecurity, I think, is going to be so important. We, uh, every day I read in our papers, local papers in Singapore, people are getting scammed. And I think, you know, that is going to be a big thing. And uh, five years ago, uh, I actually spun off a company together with two professors in the area of cybersecurity. And I think, uh, and I'm having a first-hand experience learning about how we can change the world. Thank you. Jim, your forecast? 
So my forecast as well would have been around AI, but I'm going to try to try something different. I, I think that for 2024, we're going to see workforce development um, become ever more important, um, integrating um, what, uh, especially underserved communities, um, to uh, to participate um, in the in STEM-based fields. Uh, at GW, for example, we're working very closely with um, partners in the, with tech apprenticeships um, in terms of bringing people who may not have a traditional STEM background into the STEM workforce. And I think that's going to be a trend that'll um, get e even stronger in 2024. Thank you. Dr. Norris? Yeah, I, I'm just excited by the concept of what AI can and generative AI can do for us. And I think as humans, we have a hard time of even wrapping our heads around what exponential growth looks like. Um, I'm, I'm taught, brought back to that old um, chessboard game um, narrative of the emperor who had ordered a new game because of the fact he was bored with old games. So he was happy when he said to inventor, name your reward and you will get it. The inventor asked for a simple reward. I'd like to have one grain of rice on the first chess square, two on the second, four on the third, and so on, doubling the amount of rice on every one of the 64 chess squares. And he ended up with a pile of rice bigger than Mount Everest. Um, it's really hard to understand exponential growth and it's hard to wrap our mind around it, but that is the curve I see us on right now. So the challenge is somehow to ride that curve and make sure that it's used for the benefit of humanity. Thank you so much. Chairman Babars. Thank you. Thank you, dear Ingrid. Uh, Ingrid, you, you know, uh, one of the capitals of innovation is Israel. And unfortunately, unfortunately, instead of benefiting from these innovative skills of these people, I think the world is really consuming, wasting uh, time uh, because of the. So I think, I think, in 2024, I am dreaming a world where everybody is so dealing with entrepreneurship and innovation, and they are not able to find time to fight with each other. I'm not only talking for these uh, current issues in Israel, but this is the case for many countries, as a matter of fact, in, in the world. Uh, let's let's uh, dream a world uh, where innovation and entrepreneurship also helps uh, help, uh, people uh, to, to uh, create more common goods uh, for the world and uh, everybody benefits uh, from, from the secret uh, skills, uh, skills uh, of everybody in the world. Uh, I think not only financial inclusion, but also humanistic inclusion is also uh, very, very important. And I am thanking so much for giving this uh, floor to me to share my uh, wishes for 2024 here. Thank you so much. And now I'll just briefly share a, a screenshot of our MOU. And I would like to congratulate both organizations for uh, making this happen. I really appreciate it. And uh, even on a personal note, I'm very happy for this, as I mentioned, because I feel it's it's so important and I hope we'll have many more MOUs like this uh, coming down the, the pipeline. So for um, our audience members that might not be familiar why we signed this MOU and what the main purpose is, I would just like to briefly highlight that the purpose of this agreement was to establish an academic partnership that will contribute to the development of skills and expertise of students and faculty members, assist in the digital transformation of higher education institutions, and foster creative thinking for innovation and success in the 21st century market environment. For those of you that might not be familiar with the George Washington University Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship and joined us today, we just wanted to briefly share highlights it is housed under the Office of the Vice Provost for Research at the George Washington University and provides programming around innovation, education, venture creation, and making connections to support George Washington entrepreneurs and the Mid-Atlantic startup community. OIE's efforts have resulted in over 1,500 teams trained, over 350 ventures started, and over 1.4 billion in follow-on funding raised. That's more than the GDP of, of a few countries I know, uh, unfortunately. 
So the National Science Foundation, also iCorps program, is intended to give participants an avenue to pursue the commercialization of their research. And that's a, a vibrant uh, part of the program. For those of us uh, in our audience, of course, we know WBF, but maybe other members are not as familiar. I just wanted to also briefly share that our financial inclusion program for higher education aims to complement activities offered at George Washington University. We are going to contribute and collaborate on opportunities for students to access our global coaches and mentors and entrepreneurs, and of course, all the educational uh, activities that we're offering through both schools. So thank you once again. Congratulations. And uh, do we have our bell, Chairman Berbers, or we're just needing a virtual bell today? <laughs> Let's make our hands, <laughs> use our hands as, 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 a, as a bell. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, Ingrid, uh, congratulations uh, for uh, making uh, all these things happen, I think. And on, on, beh uh, on behalf of WBEF, I want to thank you very much uh, for, for um, uh, creating this bridge between the George Washington University Innovation Center, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center, and WBEF. Uh, our our uh, U.S. office in D.C. I think is working very well, uh, isn't it, uh, dear uh, Dr. Norris? And uh, uh, thank you very much again uh, for your uh, for your uh, leadership, uh, dear Indra. By the way, by the way, uh, tomorrow evening, uh, a delegation from the United Arab Emirates under the Trade Ministry um, a Minister is coming to Istanbul uh, and visit some techno parks and. Um, you know, the United Arab Emirates has some uh, uh, sub-states. Uh, Dubai is one of them, Abu Dhabi is one of them, and one of them is Sarja. And uh, Sarja has a, a university city, uh, 22 universities in the same lands with a technology park. And the CEO of the park uh, and his, uh, the city uh, will visit uh, Webeb Terrace, Istanbul, tomorrow evening after they land. And uh, most probably next week, uh, we will we will announce uh, another collaboration. And after announcing this collaboration, I think it will be fine to come together and see how the George Washington University, the United Arab Emirates, the WBEF, we can do together uh, more uh, for for uh, for the world. Uh, thank you very much again. Indeed. Thank you. Before we conclude, I would just like to remind our audience to register for the WBF 2023 Congress that we referenced several times today. And I'm also um, wishing success to the two startups from the George Washington University that were selected to represent the United States on the global fundraising stage. So uh, I'm looking forward to, the, to their pitch and I'm sure they're going to do great. Thank you. This concludes our presentation. Once again, this was the MOU signing of the OIE of George Washington University with the WBA Financial Inclusion Center. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Norris, yeah. Dr. Chang, Dr. Brooks, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.